It was a terrible winter, a terrible winter storm with some 20 inches of snow. I was in the seminary back then, and we were in the midst of a terrible winter storm. And the parish where I was having an internship at received a phone call from a family who had just had a huge tragedy happen to them. A huge tragedy. See, I was barely getting my feet wet into this ministry thing, and there I come into this scene at this family's home where the father of the family left home in the morning before his kids had even woken up, and he went to work, but he couldn't make it to work because of the snowstorm. So he came back home, and without going inside, he began to use the snow blower and blow the snow away from the driveway. And without knowing that his children were at home, they didn't go to school because it was a snow day, he got into his truck, his 4x4 four four truck, to move the truck so that he could blow the snow away from where the truck was parked. And without knowing it, he backed the truck into his four-year-old son who had left the home unbeknownst to him and he crushed his four-year-old son. All he could hear as he was backing the truck up, he said, was the cracking sound of him crushing his own son. He killed his own son in this freakish accident. I'm trying to keep my composure here as I tell you this story because I'm there right now in that living room of the family as I walk into this situation. And the mother who was weeping, can you imagine the desperation in that family? She was weeping. The whole family was weeping. They were screaming, there was anger, there was frustration, and I come into this scene, and she sees me, and she sees my Roman collar, I had a Roman collar on, and she thought I was a priest, and so she comes right at me, and she grabs my shoulders, and she says, why did God take my son? Why, Father, why did God take my son? Tell me, as she grabbed me by the shoulders, tell me, why did God take my son? And she began to shake me over and over again. Why, why? I didn't know what to say. What can you say? What can you say in a situation that doesn't have any answers. What can you say? There is nothing to say. And so all I did was the only thing I know how to do well, which is to be honest. So I looked at her with tears in my eyes, with this look of desperation on my face as well. And I said, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't have any answers for you. I don't know why this happened. And I cried with them. I wept. And this immense frustration in me at this lack of answers was visible. The tension was immense. I threw my hands in the air and I said over and over again, I don't know. And at this, the grandmother comes into the scene and says, It's okay, Father. It's 
okay, you don't have to say anything. What matters is that you are here with us. What matters is that you are here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. What matters is that you are here. You don't have to say anything. And then I said, and only then I was able to say, let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. This is what Jesus does today as well. In this gospel that we just heard, he doesn't provide answers as to why Lazarus died. When Mary and Martha, in their own frustration, cry out, If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, they say to Jesus, this would not have happened. If you had only been here, they, they grabbed him in like manner like that mother grabbed me in that living room. And they say, why? Why weren't you here? Isn't this our frustration right now? As we're going through this pandemic situation, don't we want to grab God's shoulders and say, why? Why is this happening? Why are so many people dying? Why are so many people sick? Why is our economy going down the tubes? Why is this happening? Why is the stock market crashing? Why are so many people unemployed? Why, why is this happening? Why, is there, why am I so depressed? Why do I have all these problems? Why is this happening? Why can't I leave my house? Why? And there are no answers. And God doesn't give us answers. As he went with Martha and Mary, over the death of their brother, Jesus weeps with us. It's the only time in the Bible where we hear this word. Three words, and Jesus wept. He weeps. There's nothing that moves me like those three words. And Jesus wept. As he wept with Mary and Martha, he weeps today with us. For he is not the God who fixes us, but he is the God who accompanies us, who is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Not the fixer God, but the present God. I'm not going to get over this. The mother said, I'm not going to get over this. We often feel like that when we come upon a problem or a tragedy in our life. I'm not going to get over this. And, and it's okay to be angry with God. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to be mad. To say, I'm angry that this happened. Isn't this what we have to be in our honesty, able to admit that we are angry, we are mad right now? I'm so mad for this coronavirus. How will I get over this? How will we make it? And Jesus weeps. He continues to weep over a broken world and Jesus wept and he continues to weep when he sees us and our frustrations and our depression and our anxiety and how we think we won't make it and when he sees us fearful he continues to weep when our hearts are breaking Jesus's heart is breaking they sent word to Jesus to come but he didn't come on time. And now they say to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here. In other words, where the bleak were you, they said to him. Where were you? How could 
you let this happen? How could you let this pandemic happen? This coronavirus pandemic. How could you? The people are crying. Jesus wept. Jesus is crying. He doesn't say much. He doesn't answer. He weeps. We think he doesn't answer, right? We think he doesn't answer, but he does. Humanly speaking, God doesn't answer in our own human understanding. But in God's understanding, for God's ways are not our ways, God does answer. And he does have an answer. And his answer is Jesus. God doesn't give us an answer. God gives us Jesus. And Jesus is enough. He's enough. You want answers? You've got an answer. You've got Jesus. So God doesn't give us a human answer. God gives us his son. His answer is not words, but actions by giving us Emmanuel, God with us. The God who walks with us, who sits with us, who holds us, who holds our hands, the God who weeps with us. We've got Jesus, God's answer to every problem. You have it. He is the answer. He is the only answer to something like the coronavirus pandemic. Only Jesus. When we are crying, Jesus is weeping there in that home with that family where I found myself. Jesus was there weeping with us. We are not alone. You are not alone. God is with you there in your pain, in your frustration, in your depression, in your desperation, in your problems, in your suffering. God is with you. You are not alone. Emmanuel, God with me, God with us. So no one can be against us. What more do we want? We've got Jesus. We have it all. Mary and Martha, you know, let us look at these two women. They are living in a man's world 2,000 years ago in a patriarchal society. If you think women have it tough today, think about women 2,000 years ago. They couldn't work. They were pure property. A woman without a man had two choices, either to become a prostitute or to beg for her sustenance. A woman without a man in that society was nothing. And these two women have just lost their only male relative in their life, their brother. Can you imagine the desperation, the desperate situation in the life of these two Ladies, now in this society, in man's world, these women see nothing but gloom and darkness. Can you imagine what they're feeling? Try to put yourself in their situation. What are they saying? What will we do now? What will we do now? They think. We are going to die. We are going to perish. We are done. This will be the end of our life now. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that how so many of us are feeling right now? We are going to die. This coronavirus will, will, will be the end of us, the end of our world, the end of our society. How will we survive? How will we recover? ladies are feeling. This disaster, this is a disaster. Our, our only sustenance is gone. Our brother has died. 
how will we recover from this tragedy? Isn't this what we're feeling right now? How will we recover? And what happens? They think everything is over. The brother is in the tomb. He's buried. He's been there four days. It already stinks. Huh? In fact, I like the King James Version translation. I read a number of translations when I get ready for preaching, and the King James translation says, It stinketh. It stinketh. You know what I have to say right now, this coronavirus stuff stinketh. It stinks, in other words. It stinks. It's it stink in their life. Their situation and this coronavirus situation stinks right now. And just when you think it stinks, that everything is over, Lazarus is in the tomb, what happens? The same thing that happened in the life of these two sisters, Mary and Martha. What happened? Jesus showed up. No, Jesus showed up. He always shows up. That is his promise. Jesus shows up. Jesus comes. And what do they say to Jesus? The same thing we want to say to him because he has shown up in our life. We want to say the same thing. He's been dead for four days. This is the end. We think and we, we want to say this to Jesus just like they were so hopeless it's the end don't even go there jesus you know and what does jesus say well he doesn't think the way we do he thinks the way god does and he sees with the eyes of god and he doesn't think the way these two ladies do jesus thinks the way god did god does we think in human ways and in human terms, but Jesus thinks in God's terms, and it's not the end. It is not the end. This coronavirus is not our end. It is not the end. It will not have the best of us. We will overcome. We shall overcome. We will come out more glorious and more victorious for the same Jesus that rose Lazarus from the dead, even though it was a stinky situation, a hopeless situation. He rose him from the dead. That same Jesus that rose Lazarus from the dead will bring us out of this deadly situation as he declares now to us in the verse before the gospel that we just heard, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. And I am in charge. Not no coronavirus. I am in charge, says Jesus. And I make all things new. And I will make this horrible, stinky situation new. I will renew it. What is Jesus saying? Lazarus, come out. In like manner to jolt us to bring us life where death seems to be winning because death does not have the final word for what happened to Lazarus those of us who think we are bound by death we are not just like Jesus rose Lazarus up from the dead, he's saying to us, I will raise you up. Life is brought where death seems to be winning. Grief is overcome by the power of God's love because Jesus is in the business of bringing life to death. Ever since that day, some 2,000 years ago, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he is in that same 
business of raising dead stuff to life to this very day. Life is brought where death seems to be winning. And life wins because Jesus, our God, is in the life business, not the death business. He is in the unbinding business. Isn't that what he says? Roll away the stone. Unbind him. That's what he's saying over and over to us. Jesus wants to come right now and unbind you. Roll away the stone of the grave, of the cave where you may find yourself in the cave of desperation, in fear and gloom, the cave of depression, the cave of your problems, the cave of your bills. And he wants to come in there and say, come out of that tomb, come out of that cave where you find yourself in, come out of that darkness and come into my life says Jesus. Come out! And he looks at you right now and says, unbind him. Unbind her. Jesus wants to unbind us for us not to remain in the dark tomb of fear, depression, anxiety, or worry so that you do not remain in the gloom of helplessness and hopelessness because you are not hopeless. You have Jesus. And just like he unbound Lazarus, he wants to unbind each and every one of us who find ourselves in the cave of our living rooms and inside of our homes all locked in for fear. Each and every one of us, he wants to take us out of that tomb, out of ourselves. Come out, says Jesus. Leave the tomb. Don't allow, in other words, your sadness to control you. Don't allow your pain to control you. Don't allow your fear to control you. Jesus is in control. And Jesus is hope. Jesus is calling. Come to me. Come to life. As we control as we confront this coronavirus, as we confront our anxiety and our fear and this sickness, remember the Jesus who stands over you like he stood over the tomb where Lazarus was already sinking away. Just like he did with Lazarus, what did he say to him? Come to life. So if your marriage feels like it's dead, Jesus is there breathing life into it. If your addiction is killing your mind and your relationship, Jesus is there saying, untie him, untie her, let him or her be free. He is there freeing you. If someone you trusted has betrayed you, there is Jesus saying, come to me and trust me. I am here. I am with you. Come to life. Come to life. We have a God who knows what hopelessness feels like. Who is saying to us right now, come to me, you who feel like life is burdensome. And rest in me. Allow me to untie you so that you can go and untie others. Let me free you from your tomb so that you can be with your newfound hope and love that instrument that unties others. Let me untie you from your fears, free you from those fears so that you may untie the fears of others. Let me untie you from the fear of this coronavirus pandemic so that you can then be an instrument that unties others from their fears, from their despair, from their depression, from their anxiety. Come out! 
Come out. Come out. And live the life that I have prepared for you. Come out. Be real. Come out of the tomb and live.